Good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we simply are in science of games. I am Josh Bleiser, and we have another great cast lined up. My guest tonight is currently working on the game The Shadow Government Simulator, which, by the time you are watching this, it should be coming out in a few months. So, please welcome to the cast from Chupacabra Game Studios, Raphael. How are you doing? Doing good, Josh. Thank you for having me. How are you? I am doing all right. For those of you listening to this, we are recording this just before the holidays in 2021. So the weather is changing and we're all getting ready, I guess, to hopefully have a week off or a few days off at least. (laughs) That sounds nice. (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) But uh, thank you again for wanting to come on. For those of you listening, we're always looking for new guests and it's always great to talk to new indie developers. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit, of course, about your game. And for those of you listening to this, depending on when this cast goes up, it should be going up in early access. So things that we talk about may not be 100% as they are in the game. So to get the ball rolling then, could you talk a little bit about your background and what is the Shadow Government Simulator? Sure thing. So um, I'm Rafa. I'm a Mexican game developer. I'm based off of Vancouver. I've been working in video games for about 10 years now in m- multiple branches of the games industry. Like I've worked in like medical games, educational games, mobile, VR, AR, console. And there's a little bit of everything. And uh, obviously, indie games are something that have always been close to my heart. Uh, I've been an indie developer like full time in the past, and now I'm doing indie development on the side with uh, my company Chupacabra, which is basically the only reason it was created to uh, to allow me to create have a, a, a space in which I can create, make my own games, do more experimental stuff, something that is not necessarily going to sell well, but it's interesting and it's interesting to make. And that's something that really motivates me. And that's uh, where this game comes from as well. All right. So what is the uh, Shadow Government Simulator about? So the Shadow Government Simulator is a game where you are leading a secret society for world domination. (laughs) Uh, Instead of being a game where you're fighting the Illuminati or fighting the Templars, you are the Illuminati. You are the secret society. And it is all about infiltrating nations, uh, bribing, seducing, intimidating those that have power within that society, and then uh, basically slowly take it over. <laughs> of course, a very uh, peaceful uh, topic, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say there is not a lot of violence in it compared to other uh, turn-based strategy games. Uh, there's So far, there's not a single uh, extraneous death in it. <laughs> <laughs> So is the Shadow Government Simulator like your first official indie game, or have you worked on other ones in the past? I've worked on other indie games, but they've never actually made it to launch. Like mm-hmm. I've worked in several several games, uh, even presented a couple, uh, presented one in uh, at PAX, but by the time we were pa- PAX uh, Indie Mega Booth, but by the time that you know we were trying to continue with production, funding dried up, and we weren't able to release. So this is... This is uh, the first one where I am I am able to launch the game and just see it through all the way to completion. All right, yeah. It can be very difficult, I think, sometimes when it comes to, you know, getting that first game out there. I've seen a lot of developers, unfortunately, get, have trouble for one reason or another. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, and I think that one of the advantages I have right now is that I, I am also employed. So I'm able to finance my game. I'm able to finance the production. And if it takes more time because I'm not able to put uh, the necessary hours in it each day, it's okay because I'm not depending on it. Um, the first uh, the first uh, times I went into this rodeo, like I was full-time indie, right? And that meant that when when money dried up or when uh, some unforeseen circumstance happened, it, the shock was a lot stronger, uh, and, and the projects didn't get finished because of that. Yep. And 
there's of course the trouble when it comes to the scope of a game as well that a of lot of indie developers sadly struggle with just how big do you want to make that game because we can see it from both sides these days that if you make your game too small it's not going to make a dent in the market make it too big and you can easily go over your budget and end up with a game that it's just not going to return enough money to keep you going yeah of course and, and something that i think a lot of developers forget about is all the like um incidental non-development aspects of launching a product it's not just about making levels and making content, right? You have to worry about localization. You have to worry about your Steam page. You have to worry about marketing. All these things are uh, are like a lot of work. A special note of here, marketing, that is like my biggest cross to bear. I ha I'm not really good at it. And it is something that takes a significant amount of time just uh, let alone people think of something as marketing as like, oh, I'm going to do some tweets, do some posts on Reddit. But being very conscientiousness of it, following, okay, what kind of posts work the best? How can I get the maximum effect out of this GIF? Uh, what is the best copy? Does this copy work well on Twitter versus in Reddit versus on Steam itself? That is a full-time job as well. And I think a lot of uh, new developers are not aware of the, the little black hole that can become. Oh, yes. And as just a quick pause for a second, would you be able to raise your volume up just a little bit? It's just a little bit quiet on this end. Is this better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah, and I'll be adding the volume as well as we, when I do the actual editing, so that should be fine. Okay, three, two, one. Yeah, and like, I am also with you when it comes to being bad in terms of marketing and stuff like that. Like, Twitter is basically the my main thing and even that I am not the best at. <laughs> it's also sometimes like you are in the echo filter of game development in inside Twitter, right? Like uh, people I follow are game devs and people that follow me are game devs, but they're, it's not necessarily a game strictly for game devs, right? Like it is, mm -hmm. you're trying to reach a wider audience and it is, it is a tough nut to crack. Like not, I'm not, Sure, I've not been sold on the idea that our average game enthusiasts, game players, look for new games on Twitter. Yep, it is a lot that goes into getting somebody to check out your game, and you never know where they're going to find you. That's the scary part. Um, yeah, yeah. With some of my YouTube videos, I got a message from someone while I was live streaming the other day saying, I love your content. I found this video you did. It's like a three-year-old video that they just stumbled <laughs> upon. And it is definitely a crazy thing. And, you know, I think there's always that problem with the echo chamber. That, like, even for, like, the stuff that I do, that it's hard to know sometimes, am I making something that is going to appeal to a lot of people? Or just to my friends who always tell me, oh, yeah, it's perfect. Don't change anything. Because I have seen plenty of indie games that the developer is just utterly blindsided sometimes yeah. when it gets released in terms of the reception. And most of the time, it's negative. Sometimes there are happy stories that we have seen games like, um, was it Dyson Sphere Program, uh, Gunfire Reborn, that developers had no idea that it was going to blow up, and they, it just got, you know, it became this, like, whole phenomenon. There's no other way to describe it. Yeah, and there it is, it is kind of an uncontrollable force at that point, right? It's not something you can plan. I'm going to plan to have this, uh, this mm -hmm. viral success. And it, it's something that you just keep trying your best, and uh, hopefully one of those actually does pick off. And you're right. Like for every one success, there's a lot more that just are surprised negatively because of that. Um, and that, honestly, that's one of the things that I, I felt most affected by the pandemic itself. Um, here in Vancouver, we have these um, get-togethers. We have like for indie developers. There's a full indie. There's another one called the Indie Pod which is awesome because you get to talk to other developers that are working on all their own things. You get to show your demos, like literally bring your laptop to a bar. Hey guys, play my game. But that like absolutely stopped. And yeah. uh, sure, I have testers. I have a Discord channel of people that play the game, but it is very different from actually just hovering above someone's shoulder and seeing, okay, they're, how are they playing the game? As opposed to just getting feedback out of testers where they tell you, oh, it's good, it's bad, I like this or that. But 
how they do it, like watching someone play live is something that ha has been really tough. Yep. Um, one thing that I've learned actually during that, like kind of, uh, uh, it's not the best, but it's, it is a, a good alternative, is uh, reaching out to streamers, but not to the big ones, reaching out to smaller streamers, uh, people that have like 20 views, maybe less. Um, it doesn't because at the end of the day, what you want to see is someone play your game and voice their thoughts out loud, and that's that's their whole business, right? Like that's what they do. They play games while telling people what they think, and as they record it, you get to see every single step. Um, a lot of a lot of them tell their even their thought process as as they're doing stuff, and you do lack that back and forth at the end, like oh, why did you do this? Or, why did why, what were you thinking when you did that? But you know, given the circumstances, it's a uh, it's a good alternative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had developers like tune in when I play their games during my Wednesday night streams, and it is very informative to like see somebody, especially if it's somebody who knows about design. And I guess I have to toot my own horn here a little bit <laughs> when it comes to that, because a lot of people have comment on just how much information I give regarding UI UX and the general gameplay loop when I play their titles. Um, funny enough, I played someone's game. I'm not going to name them because they may die of embarrassment, but <laughs> we found like a major bug at the very end of the game with like how it was spawning the boss. So I just kept hitting the button, causing the boss to just keep respawning over and over oh. again. And they just said in chat, Josh, you just killed me. You just murdered me like on stream. During the stream. Yes. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, like things will always break during demos, huh? It's just like oh. a truism in life. <laughs> yep, and I tend to be somebody who finds those bugs a lot, especially if it's coming from like a first time developer or somebody submitting like an alpha build. Like I will I will say, oh yeah, this build is perfectly fine, you won't find any problems, and then don't worry, I'll I'll find something by the end of our little play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I found that also like the speed running community is really good at that kind of stuff. Like if you want and you know, as a developer, it is useful to have people that are just good at breaking games and that finding cheats and finding exploits. Um, just today, actually, I received a beta uh, report from one of my beta testers that conquered half the world just based on seduction and charming, like, <laughs> not even uh, investing any other part of, of the game. Like, well, okay, <laughs> that has to be patched. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a little bit when I play this game from a developer, uh, Vic Davis made some like really complicated rpgs and i remember like in the middle of an interview i told him about this really great strategy that almost broke the game he was like oh that's how that works well i gotta change that now <laughs> and i just like ruined the strategy for everyone who was listening <laughs> they were like oh, i could have discovered it yeah <laughs> speaking of hidden costs of development that's another one as well like uh, the more complex your game, um, the more testing and balance is going to cost you. Like, oh, yes. Um, I like strategy games. I like making strategy games. But the, I know that the deeper they are, there is a, there's a hidden cost there at the end of like, okay, how do all these things actually fit together? Oh, for sure. I remember, um, I don't know if you heard of the game Duskers. It was yes. done by, oh yeah, like I spoke with Tim Keenan about this. This was like four or five years ago. And he said like one of like the most valuable things was putting the game on early access because everyone who bought it was just, you know, ripping the game apart in terms of figuring <laughs> out how everything worked. And basically right with all the playtesting, all the playtesting in the world that he could need for that game. And yeah, like you said, like, the more esoteric, the more unique your game is, the harder it gets in terms of playtesting, in terms of figuring out do people like this game or not. And I have played my fair share of indie games that are very experimental, very unique games, but they have horrible UX. Like, it is just frustrating to play them. And I think that's where the other aspect of playtesting comes in, that... It's great to have experts who will take apart your game, but you also need that new players, that fresh experience. Because, again, there are so many games out there that really kill their market potential because they only appeal to maybe 10 to 15% of the people who actually play it, and nothing else was done 
to make it more accommodating or more approachable to other people. Yeah, like uh, and, and that that is a balance for sure. Like mm-hmm. the more novel your mechanics, making them accessible is is hard because there's a lot of uh, previous knowledge that we just assume players have, right? And then we're like, okay, this is not something that we need to uh, to tutorialize. But the moment you're adding new stuff, um, like for example, in Shadow Government Simulator, it's a turn-based strategy game, but it doesn't, it, and it has units, but the units don't move. There's, it's not like a hex game. It's really about each unit being a node in a network and how you connect your network and how you disconnect them is core to the game. But this is something that is not seen in other games. It's not easy to point to, oh, it's kind of like game X. If you mm-hmm. play game X, you will understand how to play this game. Something that from a very basic level has to be taught to players. And the ramifications of what these, uh, this new mechanic is, is something that uh, players will not necessarily understand until they've played a little bit. And you have to be very careful with that. Um, I had big trouble in like the third step of my tutorial because even though I talked about the connections, we never really dug deep into them. And then I, I had players that were dropping out in the tutorial. And that's like, you know, oh, my heart. That was just like killer shot right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, like a few of the shows I do on Game Wisdom, one of the shows that I review the completion rates. Of, I talk about what we can learn by looking at the achievements, you know. How many people made it through the tutorial? How many people made it to stage three or beat this boss? And people will quit a game faster than I think a lot of developers realize. I have seen games that they don't even finish the tutorial. The tutorial could be literally 90 seconds long and people already quit the game. Like they're not even interested in it. And it's why I think a lot of us like really harp on good tutorials, good UI, good UX. Because it's not always, it's never about getting 100% of the people. That's just impossible. It's about just making sure that at least somebody knows what's happening and they can make a decision after that. Yeah, that first time user experience is absolutely crucial. And uh, just as a little bit of a tangent, uh, in free to play games, like people will drop off after watching the loading screen. You know what? Actually, before that, I've seen Mm -hmm. metrics of a 5% drop during the loading screen <laughs> like in a, and they're not coming back they just, oh yeah uh, took a minute too long i'm gone boom yeah and even with that like a lot of mobile free-to-play games have really good tutorials like for the people who get in like they do a really good job of walking somebody through because again they know that a confused person is not going to spend money if they don't know what's going on they're not going to spend one cent on any of those gotchas or loot boxes so we have to hammer home how all this works. And I think a big important uh, thing that the mobile game industry does really well, which I think us indies should do as well, is uh, analytics. Like being able to follow the path of a player through that first time user experience. The more information you have on them, the better you can adapt. Like it's okay to have a game out there that is, you know, is rough around the edges, as long as you're able to see what what those edges are, which are the ones that are trapping players, then start sanding them out. I mean, that is the point of early access. And I think uh, the game devs, indie game devs particularly, have to just kind of like put more emphasis on that. Oh, yes. Um, another show that I do on the channel is that we review Steam store pages and we look at how the marketing works and we're always looking for games for that. Uh, for people listening to us right now, we're hoping to do kind of like a soft relaunch of the show in 2022. So we are always looking for submissions along those lines. But yeah, like the analytics, I think, is a very important point that a lot of, especially new developers, even those that are coming from major companies to making their first indie game tend not to realize like its importance. Because the thing that I've always said is that the issues that we talk about that people will bounce off a game for, they're not deep mysteries. They're not something that takes 500 hours of play and you just spend millions of dollars of research. They're often something that you'll find out within 40 seconds of loading a game up. And like people who've watched me know that I've said that I can usually judge a game in about 15 to 20 minutes of play. And if in that 20 minutes of play something annoys me, most likely I know that game is going to not do well. And 
it sounds, I think, to a lot of people who don't understand design, it sounds like, you know, a bunch of hoopla. You know, how can somebody learn or figure this stuff out? But again, like, if I load up your game, the very first jump in a platformer feels horrible. <laughs> you know, nothing else you're putting on top of that is going to fix that opening moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, like, uh, players are savage. Like, I, I think that's something that mm -hmm. indie developers have to really, really understand is that they will not give us the time of day, right? Like, they will judge us harshly right away and then just leave. And, and it is unfortunate, especially yeah. for, like, new... It's a, it's a balance for uh, more experimental stuff because sometimes for experimental games you need them to understand the whole system in order for the, like, the experiment to really come through, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why iterating on that first-time user experience, getting that data, just doing it over and over again it is so important. Yep, and it's always that push between, you know, the art side of the game versus the product or the consumer side. Because I've seen developers who will argue against changes or issues saying, you know, that's not the vision or we want the player to feel like this. But again, the problem is at the end of the day, a video game is a product that if you're putting a price tag on it, you have to make that product as appealing as possible. And it is that tough line to walk because we can look at games like Papers, Please, uh, Disco Elysium, and many other like experimental or very unique indie games that they're not meant to be, you know, mass market appeals or they're not, you know, perfectly approachable. But again, like we said, like when it comes to analytics, figuring out why somebody plays a game, and why somebody doesn't play a game, it's very important to understand that about your game and make those adjustments. Yeah. And, um, uh, to your point, so a, a deeper issue that I also feel that occurs there is setting expectations at the start of a project, right? And making sure that you as a developer really understand why you're making the game. Because it's totally fine to make a game for yourself, right? Or to oh, express yeah. yourself. But if it doesn't sell well, then you have to be okay with that because that was not the point of the project. Your expectation was to put your heart out there, go for it. If your expectation is not to make a project, but to make a product, okay, well, how much do you actually want to make back, right? Because when your mindset is as a product instead of a project, sometimes it's okay to kill them, you know, and say, okay, you know what? This game will not make it. Uh, I can force uh, one of my previous indie games that I had, it was a, a Rubik's uh, cross between Rubik's Cube and Lemmings. So you had the lemmings inside the <laughs> Rubik's Cube, and then you would be able to twist them around to get super fun concept, <laughs> terrible product. Like, it was niche. It was hard to make levels. Uh, the UX was hard to navigate. No way I could have launched it. So, you know, it died. But it, I was with it, it had the intention to make a product, so that would make sense. Oh, yes. And... Yeah, the idea again of trying to balance what is the game and what is the product is very hard. Because like you said, like it's different if you're making a small project, you know, this is not even part-time. It's like spare time if I have like an hour a week to work on something. And something that I say a lot in my videos and pieces is that if you have no intention of, you know, making this your primary job, don't listen to a word that I'm saying. Like, what I'm talking about is specifically for people who are trying to make a game that is marketable, that, you know, something that you could make a living off of if it does take off. Because, again, as we said, like, it is very risky to make a video game. Yes. And it's even, it's gone even more than that in the last six, seven years that. It's no longer indie game is, you know, this rare thing that never happens. Like, I get 20 to 30 indie games being released every week. And there is, no, like, even for somebody like me, I can't play them all. And even, like, the amazing ones, the ones that people can't stop talking about, I'll still miss a few of them. Like, even my uh, top 10 list, which for people watching this in the future should hopefully be up by now for 2021... Most of them are indie games. And I'm sure that 
several of those games, most people who will read that list have never ever heard of. Like they have they don't even know that it exists. Just as there's gonna probably be one or two that people probably know well, they're well acquainted with, and you know, that game has probably succeeded by now. But yeah, I have played games that again, like it, it kills me when I see a game that I really like. It has like less than fifty reviews on Steam. Oh, and yes. the thing is that's not hyperbole. Like for people who watch I could name a few of those games that had like less than actually 30 reviews for like the first year of it being out. And there's just so much that goes into making a game work that I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize. Uh, it's very true. And, and I think that uh, something that all new game developers, new indie game developers should be aware of is that commercially their first project might fa well fail. You know, like oh yes. Just by, by stats, right? It will fail. Um, I remember I was talking to a student uh, a couple of months back who was asking, "So oh, I have this great idea for a game." You know, it was like massively out of scope. It was mm -hmm. like uh, uh, total annihilation. No, actually, more like Supreme Commander, but where you could actually go in and have like Skyrim style role play. Oh, and yeah, like massively. And and what I told him was like, "Man, like don't." use your best idea as your first idea, right? Sure, like it's an awesome game. Don't use it right now. Just try something simpler first. Get into the habit of releasing because that's another thing. It is different to make a game than it is to release a game. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and so just get comfortable with that. And then you can then you can continue working on it. Like I wouldn't advise someone to start like quit their day job to become a full indie developer if they, if they can't handle that risk. If they don't have a good several years worth of runway it, just in case it fails and then they have to look for a job afterwards. Mm -hmm. Which, no shame. You know, you, you tried it. This, this is good. But be prepared. Mm -hmm. yep, I know uh, Jake Burgett from Grayling has made several talks on that very topic. And it is, again, that difficulty of what can you actually release? Not what you can actually develop, but what can you actually release as a game? And when you said like Total Annihilation meets Skyrim, like about like three different red flag alarms went off in my head. I know a few developers who are watching this, they're probably like the warning siren is going off, like hearing that description. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always like the A meets B, um, like. It's all it's a type of game design that a lot of people like to use as a shorthand for the game, but it is I always find it at least a yellow flag when people say it. <laughs> um going I guess a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of it, it's because the dynamics of a game change if you start messing with the mechanics of it. So if you're just like mashing two things together, it does not necessarily mean it'll play the way you expect them to play. Uh, and having, I feel that in terms of hooks, having a hook that is more particular to this game, as opposed to just being a mashup of two other games, would make me more, it would make it more enticing, but also give it a clearer direction. Again, like as we said, and as we, as I've talked about plenty of times, like the actual game dev side of making a game is often one where a lot of people tend to not really understand the idea that you need to have a plan that you should have some idea as to where this game is going to go. Because we've seen, again, like, anyone watching this right now, like, you know, if I had a nickel for every time a developer said, I didn't think it would take this long to make something, I, I may be rich at this point. And it is very difficult to, you know, sit down and say to yourself, what could I make in 12 months? What could I do in two years of time? Because like another thing that I'm sure you're well aware of is that when you are starting out, it takes you a lot longer to do something as opposed to working on a genre that you are well acquainted with. Yep. And like that's another thing that I hear from developers is that, you know, if my first game took me five years to make, if I were to make the same exact thing now, I could probably do it in like one to two years because I know how everything works now. And it's, again, why we say that your first game shouldn't be your magnum opus dream game that, you know, you expect that you'll be able to retire to your own private <laughs> island when it gets released. 
Uh, my my no game developer gets to retire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it's very true. And one thing that again, just with going on with the theme of hidden costs, uh, there's a lot of hidden costs and lessons in the piping of a game. You know, how do you make a good uh, initialize sequencer so you can initialize things at the correct time? How do you make a save and load management system? <laughs> Those are things that when you're thinking of the game idea, you're, that's the last thing on your mind. But man, when you have a save bug, if you don't understand how you built the thing or how it works, it's weeks, gone. Just trying to reproduce it, trying to figure out what happened in this gray area in between your game being turned off and turned on back again. So there's a lot of like just piping and installation that goes into game development that that knowledge will be useful for any game you do in the future, even if you change genre, right? Like you will still need a level select system. You will still need a main menu. Uh, knowing how those work and how to build them, it's just months of work that you you save in future projects. And like, cause I follow a lot of developers as well on Twitter, like the uh, recent like existential nightmare that I hear from in the game dev is about the use of doors and figuring out how a door <laughs> works in the game oh man yeah I like the door problem for uh, actually that was a really recent uh, really cool article I, I read recently about the door problem specifically for combat design and how do you uh, make sure that oh. you can have combat doors that open to combat spaces that allow for this positional play in between the different units uh, but that is so easy for players to understand. It kind of like guides them into the type of combat you want them to have. Like there's a lot of thought going into just a door and how to make a door work for my type of game. Mm hmm. Yep. And again, it's something that when you're sitting there, you know, before you even put one line of code down on your computer, you're just thinking about your dream idea or, you know, this kind of game, you're not considering that. And like, it's something that, you know, when I see like students or like first time developers who like talk to me or talk to us when we're doing our streams and stuff on Discord, that they'll often struggle with just being able to say, what is this gameplay? You know, like you can say, it's a 2D platformer. Okay, that's a genre, but that's not what you're doing in that game. And it is something that I think you have to train yourself to, yes. to kind of learn. Like, uh, there are people who will like ask me these questions that I can answer within like seconds and they'll go like, you know, that took me like a few hours of thinking just to understand how to put that into words. And that's because again, like I've spoken to game developers. I've analyzed so many games over the past decade that it's as natural to me as it is to breathe. But, you know, if you go to school just for programming or if you just play a lot of video games, you're not really thinking about this stuff it will blindside you when you come to making your first game. Yes. Uh, something very important there is like, just like because I like to eat food, I'm not a chef. Like mm -hmm. just because I like to play games does not necessarily make me a game designer. Right? Yep. And the way both a chef eats food, but also a game designer plays games is very different than uh, how a player does it. Like mm -hmm. uh, when I've, um, when I've uh, led game designers at companies, we had these kind of uh, weekly, how do you call it? Like a, like a book club, it was a game club where we would just play a game for a week and we would discuss it. Mm -hmm. But one of the big caveats that I had going on there was that the games could never repeat genre. So like each game was going to be a different type <laughs> of genre, even if we were not producing it. But that's to get that sensibility out there, being able to play a dress-up game, being able to play a slot machine game, being able to play a racing game and say, okay, this is compelling to someone for some reason. Why? How does it work? What are this? If I change this system, like, and one of the assumptions we had was um, the original game designers are not imbeciles. Like, you can't say, oh, the game designer messed up here. No, no, no. They, they did that for a reason. It could have been constraints. Maybe they didn't have enough money. Maybe it was the IP that came by and said, no, you have to do it this way. That's fair. But you can't say that they did not try their best because mm -hmm. we're all trying our best. And I think a lot of lessons come from that, from just giving other games the time to sit down and analyze and start trying to figure out the thought process that went behind creating them and behind those decisions. 
Oh yeah, uh, for the people watching this recording right now, they won't be seeing our cameras, but I was just nodding my head uh, profusely <laughs> as you were saying that. Because it is very hard, I think, for a lot of people to sit down and actually break down a game like that. Um, like, for me, like, I have a rule that, you know, I never call anything stupid, I don't call develop... Like, when I talk about games, I do not insult developers, I do not say anything about the developer. Like, I will focus on this game. If something is bad or troublesome in the game, I will point it out, but I will not say, oh, developer didn't know what they were doing, or, you know, stuff like that. And I think what you said about figuring out why something is in a game, or why somebody likes a game, that is, I think, a skill worth its weight in gold for game development. Like, one of the best things about playing so many games and getting games submitted is that it has afforded me the chance to play games that I would have never have spent money on, that I would have never have looked at on Steam or Humble or Itch. And I can look at these games, and even if it's a game that I don't like, even if it's a genre that I don't play, I can still grasp why somebody plays this. Um, very recently, I played a Project Wingman. I am not a flight sim guy. I am not an arcade sim guy at all along those lines. I was still to play that game and have fun. Did I have any idea what I was doing or, you know, how the physics work? Oh. Uh, racing and, like, driving-based games as well. Um, I tried a Mud Runner earlier this year, and, you know, that is as far away from, you know, one of my games I like to play as I could get. And I can still understand that appeal. Did it work for me? No, I'm not a driving sim kind of guy. But I can explain to somebody why it would work for a driving sim kind of person. And being able to articulate that, it is a very useful skill to have. Because like you said, like it's never a case of a developer being stupid or a developer just throwing things against the wall. And there's one that I like to say is that most developers, they're not trying to make a bad game. You know, there are games out there, you know, the uh, very, like, hack and slash or cash grab kind of, yeah. like the 99 cent ones. But for most developers, they're not sitting there going, how do we make this platformer as horrible as possible? <laughs> how do we make this first-person shooter be completely horrible to the player? And then let's charge uh, 39.99 for it. They're just trying to make it. Um XCOM is an example I always turn to. The original XCOM is one of the most brilliant games. It's also one of the most dated games in terms of its UI UX. It's not a game I would recommend anyone who didn't grow up playing it to go back and play. And again, it wasn't because the developers were lazy or they didn't understand how to do it. It was just the limitations of making a game back in 1991, 1992. Yeah, I, I recently played, uh, dusted off my PS2 and played Devil May Cry. <laughs> and uh, it had uh, fixed camera positions, oh, so you would have yes. in and like there, its core was like high octane combat. So you're jumping around, <laughs> juggling enemies, and the camera would constantly switch locations, making it almost impossible to have a fight in the edge between two rooms. But it, it's what they had at the time. They they didn't have really good occlusion culling, so they had to bake all the lighting in if they wanted to get that really good. Uh, View. They had to be very careful with their polygon counts, and fixed cameras help with a lot with that. So it is one of the limitations. Um, one thing I like echoing what you're saying. I think that's also important for developers to not just play different genres, but also play different. Uh, I'm gonna call them like branches of the industry. Like it is very common when I hang out with indie friends that they're like, "Ah, oh, I just hate free to play." Like. Why are people playing that? You know, or the flip side, where I, I play, I, I'm talking to like developers and friends that are in, in free to play. And they're like, oh, I just hate how AAA does serialized content. Why is it not a service? You know, why is it not live? <laughs> just update the roster of FIFA. And the fact that they're not playing these other types of games, this other mindset in development, is really a missed opportunity. Like, I find the best developers are the ones that will play anything under the sun. Like, a slot machine, they'll play it. You know, uh, this advert game for Cheetos, they'll play it. You know, like, <laughs> and there's all, le there's lessons for us all in that. Yep, and going back to what we were just saying about, like, 
being able to study a game and figure out why something worked and why something didn't. Like, as a very interesting parallel, I was writing about this in my fourth book on horror design and how a lot of recent indie horror developers are now kind of emulating the PlayStation 2, PlayStation 1 era of survival horror. And the thing that I always see is that what they do is just say, hey, let's just have fixed camera angles. And one of the things that we say is that, yes, the fixed camera angles were a part of that style, but it's not like the reason why we play those games. Like if you just, if you're not understanding kind of the underlying elements, it leads to, I think, a lot of games feeling very hollow in their approach. Now, that, that is very true. It's like um, getting to the the little nugget of why someone plays a game is important, especially when you're trying to recreate something that existed in the past, right? Uh, or when you're trying to really like dig deep into another game. It might not be the reason that you expect it to, right? It, it might not be... Uh, I, I find, same likewise, that a lot of uh, developers focus on... Uh, these game elements just because that's the way it's been done, right? Or that's the way because X did it. As opposed to understanding it as part of a system or a part of a set of limitations, right? Now, I, I see this a lot in games where uh, there's like, for example, complex crafting systems where they will take one element of, say, uh, Minecraft or any other crafting game and just kind of ignore the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. right, they're like, oh, we're going to have a menu, uh, like a crafting inventory system like Minecraft. But why are you having this? Why, why is it adding to the game? It works. It worked for Minecraft for a set of reasons, but your game is not that. Oh, yes. It, and again, like uh, it was one of the reasons why we held Blizzard to a gold standard for most of the 90s and 2000s is that as a studio, they were one of the best when it came to analyzing game systems and why should this be in our game and how do we make it work? Nintendo would probably be another standard example of that. That just having those elements by themselves, it doesn't make your game inherently better. And like, I'm sure everyone watching this right now or listening to us, we've seen when one indie game blows up, so many other elves will try to copy or emulate that experience. But if you don't understand why those elements were in the game, you're going up with a lesser example of that game. And then there's always this question like I, I pose any developers. Why should I spend money on your version of this game when I can just buy the original version that did all right and it's still available? It's not like yeah. these games disappear. At least, especially, especially on digital these days. Uh, that, that reminds me of uh, an Onion headline. Where it's, uh, uh, it wasn't the Onion, but it was a similar kind of magazine where it says, uh, indie, indie developer uses life savings to make worse version of Super Meat Boy. <laughs> and mm. yes, like we, we really have to be able to understand what we're trying to achieve and like know that games also have a time and place, right? Like if a game exploded because of a certain time and place, making that game again is not, you're already in a different time. You're already in different moments. Your audience is in different moments. So it's not gonna be the exact same results. Again, managing expectations. Yep. Um, I When I spoke with uh, Rami Ishmael about uh, Vlambeer and their success, like he basically came out and told me that if he were to make the exact same game today, Nuclear Throne, which is one of the more celebrated indie games when it was first released, it was going to fail because the market has changed. The market changes like almost month by month these days. And it's crazy. Yeah, and it is very tough, I think, for a lot of developers in terms of that because you pretty much need to like on a test, you need to be scoring like maybe a 90 or 95 on everything if you want your game to really blow up. Now, again, people will point out games that didn't do that. Games that, you know, kind of broke those rules. Stuff like Among Us or Fall Guys or, you know, even like smaller indie games like, or quote unquote smaller games like Celeste or Getting Over It. But again, like you just said, as we've talked about, you can't just repeat what they did because they already did it. 
it, it, it sounds you know simple when we put it that way, but a lot of developers will tend to mess things up. And if you can't justify having something in your game that's going to add to it, sometimes you got to remove stuff. And yep. like when you say that to so many developers, you know, it, they get like this feeling that you're just talking about, you know, you know, gutting their baby, you know, throwing out their prized possession. But again, sometimes just can't make something work. Yeah. I also, and sure, you can try, but do you really want to have like a half hearted attempt at a feature? Do you really want to push uh, something that, because it, it will detract from your game at the end of the day, like, Players will see the game holistically. They don't see how much effort was put in any, every specific part. Um, and if you're you're over scoping, uh, you re really run the risk of just having loose ends everywhere that detract from the overall game. Um, one of my favorite developer guests I spoke with several times in the past uh, ten years was uh, Chris Park from Arkham Games, and all his games have been like very meaty, very design-heavy titles, like AI Wars, The Last Federation, and games like that. And he's spoken many times at length about that kind of challenge of figuring out what is in my game that needs to be in this game, that if I don't have this, I don't have a game. And that's what we talk about when it comes to the core gameplay loop. But then he, of course, talks about, okay, what are things I would like to have that they can help, but they're not core of that experience? And you talk about kind of almost sectioning out his game in terms of what should be in it day one, what could I save for expansions, and what would be something good or you know amazing if this game does work out well? Because I think the days in which and I'm not sure, like, this is something I'm going to pose to you, and I'm going to pose it to the people listening to us as well. Do you think the days of spending five to ten years of your life on one single idea, you know, again, making this game as magnum opus as it can be, are done? That it's better to instead focus on making one very streamlined, one very compact, competent game, and then using that as kind of like your foundation to see, you know, where the winds blow. Absolutely. Um, as you were saying, the market changes month to month. If you're trying to do a product that takes 10 years, you're going to be doing it by from, you're going to make a product for two generations behind. Now, um, I think and this is, this is something I've been thinking a lot of like, okay, well, how do we streamline game production? I think one of the big tragedies of of game developers is that we have tons of ideas, but we can't actually make all of them, right? We have to be selective of it. And the more, uh, the better we are at making these games, the faster we can produce them, then the more ideas we can actually put to paper, right? We can mm -hmm. actually put to code and, and get done. And I think that it is not necessarily about having larger teams. I don't think it's something where, or, or more time. I think that it is about scoping down. It is about finding that, uh, that nugget core appeal of your game and building on top of that. Uh, something that I've kind of been interested in experimenting in the future is more of like an evolutionary game design, where instead of thinking of a, uh, a game design as a, a single project, you actually see it across multiple products and you have, okay, this little core loop, that's going to be my first shippable game. And it's not going to be on Steam. I'm going to ship it on Itch. And it's going to be free. It's just to kind of have this core. But it's going to have the full functionality of a game. Now it's going to have its save function. It's going to have levels and end, music, all, all the bells and whistles, but it's small. And then I'm going to use that to make a bigger version of it. And maybe this one is going to go up for a dollar. You know, And then use that and get a bigger version of it. And I think that that has several advantages. Not only are you building on top of things you've already created, but you also have a better cycle of feedback because that's the other danger with spending five to 10 years on a game. It's that you spent the time. Like time is the only resource you cannot get back. Mm -hmm. And if it does not meet your expectations, whatever those expectations were, that time is gone. Yep. It was kind of like almost like an evolution of the uh, games as a service model, almost like 
a game as a franchise or like as its own like it's the sequels are in a way its own spin-offs i guess in a way yes uh, the reason why I wouldn't probably call it a sequel is because it doesn't necessarily even have to have the same genre, if you will. Like, imagine, uh, as an example, we were doing uh, a shooter, right? We could start with one of the, those old, um, oh, man, what were they called? The uh, arcade turret shooters where you would, like, Beachhead 2000, where you're just, like, static. There's waves of enemies, and you're shooting. And that is just a self-contained game. It doesn't have movement. But that could be something else. And sure, once you add movement, it stops being a turret shooter. It could become a first-person shooter. It could become a... So it is kind of a, an evolution of that. And you can gather the feedback that you got from the first one and just use that to guide your evolution of your games. Hmm. And uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is we've been talking about you know development, understanding scope, and the design. We were talking before we actually started this cast about your decision to push back the early access of the shadow government simulator. And uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot here on Game Wisdom, of course, is again, figuring out or understanding the process that goes into making these games. So I wanted to ask you, like, what was the decision to push back the design? Like, how? why did you feel that the game would need more time? Was it, as we just said, Time is an essential resource. I think it's something that a lot of developers don't necessarily grasp, I think, how important it is. Yeah, 100%. And it goes back to something we were just talking about as well, that first-time user experience. Uh, uh, what I, I did, uh, I hired some streamers to kind of play my game and just see how, how they're doing it. And I, I noticed that they were getting stuck in the tutorial. Now, all of them passed, right? All of them just kind of like muscled through it. But I know that a gamer that is just downloading your game, just as we said before, will just abandon it at that point. That friction, they're gone. Mm -hmm. Gone, bad reviews, maybe even a refund. Like absolutely worst case scenario. So well, I want to spend these extra months in just polishing that tutorial, making sure that it is something that players can easily understand the game because it's not an easy game to understand. It, it is a different kind of mechanic. It is a system heavy game where you have to understand how all these systems interact with each other. And I want to make sure that the, every step of the way, players A, understand what they need to do, B, understand why they need to do it, and C, they have a good time doing it. Uh, the results I saw during the streams were not up to my satisfaction. And as I said previously, I am fortunate enough that I'm not tied to a release date, right? So I can push it back until I say, okay, this tutorial is done. I will say this is the last component of the game. Like everything else is done. <laughs> I am happy with every, oh, happy. Um, I, I always can be better for sure. I can keep improving it. <laughs> For sure, I'm happy enough with all the different aspects of the game. But that tutorial is so important that I am willing to pay in time for it. Yeah, and I think that is a very wise decision because, as you said, uh, there's a difference between a streamer playing your game and, you know, shouldering through it or burning through it versus somebody who's going to buy your game, load it up, and go, what the hell is this? Uninstall, refund, and they're gone forever. And I think more indie developers, I think, really need to respect the launch of their game. That I see some developers, I'm not going to name names, of course, who will release a game is out on Steam, even if it's in early access or not. And there are major issues in it. Like, these aren't issues that were discovered, you know, day one. Like, these are issues they know about. And they said, oh, we'll release it, and then we'll fix it, you know, a few weeks or a month or two later. And you can't do that. Because for every person that quits your game in frustration, that is a forever lost customer. And it is so important to make sure that launch day of your game works. Because we've said this many times on our discussions here on Game Wisdom that that window of your game kind of trying to get out there and blow up in popularity 
it's getting shorter and shorter these days. Uh, like we say, like now it's maybe two weeks, maybe even like a month at most that you have in that, you know, when it's released to make the majority of your money. And if your game comes out day one and it is buggy or it's horrible, you are basically, again, just chopping your game's chances at the kneecaps. And again, I'm sure as I'm saying this, somebody is going to type a comment or send me a message saying, oh, but so-and-so didn't do well. Now they're rich and famous. But again, those are exceptions and not the norm. Yeah, no, it, it is it is important to not have that survivorship bias when looking at other games out there. Like you look at a full list of games that come out each week on Steam and you go to the like uh, uh, I'm part of a newsletter, ICO newsletter that just gives each week. Uh, these are the games that were launched uh, ordered by number of comments. So, you know, you have the big ones up top, but you look at like the bottom 50 percent. And there, there were games that were not ready for launch, right? A lot of them were like hobby games or uh, or games that were like just quick attempts. And you, you can't just, you have to understand that most of games and most players are interacting with those. And that, that's the expectation. You can't just point out at game A, game B, that's at the top of the list and expect that you'll be at that level. Like, a lot of something else that is not talked about a lot, but a lot of these game developers, like you mentioned, Papers, Please, like they, it's not their first game. They've made multiple games before. They failed many, many times, many times before they got that one exceptional hit. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Us developers have to, uh, you know, do the same. Well, hopefully not fail, but, you know, it is part of the learning process. Oh, yeah. And again, like I'm working on my next book, which. I'm hoping we'll be done by the time people actually uh, hear this recorded. It's not. I'm in deep trouble on a free-to-play and a mobile game design. And, I mean, Angry Birds is the quintessential example of that. They had, I think, over 60 different failed prototypes and projects before they got it with Angry Birds. And, like, we've, like, harped on throughout our discussion that you can't just, you know, will your first game to be a colossal success. And if you are trying to base your entire livelihood on it, you know, good luck. You know, I'm sure somebody has succeeded that way. I'm sure there is somebody out there who got their first game to be that massive success. But at the same time, though, I can, you know, easily rattle off names. You know, give me like a minute to like pull up the list in my head of developers who did not succeed on their first game and either left the industry or had to go do something else. And that, that's actually a, a crying shame, uh, people that leave the industry. Like, uh, I've worked with several people that, for multiple reasons, they just think, oh, it's impossible. I'm off. And they just leave. And it's like, it is a shame because all those lessons they learned during their first projects, success or fail, is gone. Like they'll mm -hmm. never be able to build on, on it. And as an industry, I do think we do not do a good job at retaining talent and retaining people. So like showing them that it's not just project by project, but it's a career. It's something that you, you are able to do over many years, over multiple projects, and that if one fails, it's okay because there will be more. Mm-hmm. Um, as a quick time check, we are just about an hour in, I think. Um, again, we can uh, sit here and talk about game dev forever, forever. and ever <laughs> and ever. Um, I guess, again, for people listening to us right now, that the Shadow Government Simulator, you are still working on it. You are, you've pushed back the early access to... So... Um, as I was talking about just before we started, though, there's nothing some of us are doing a follow-up cast, either right around the launch or shortly thereafter, to talk more about the specifics of the game. But uh, for right now, for people listening to us, so in terms of the general gameplay, this is something I was trying to look at, looking at the screenshots of it. Is it real-time, turn-based, or is it kind of like a uh, quasi-real-time, uh, you know, something like uh, Europa Universalis or Solaris? Uh, it's uh, definitely a turn-based strategy game. So you are 
you, uh, you are fighting against other rival factions, so Templars, Freemasons, Illuminati, and at the same time, you're fighting against the free nations of the world. So they will also take decisions. So if you invade uh, Brazil, let's say, you as the Illuminati would have a turn, the Brazilians would have a turn, uh, the Templars would have a turn. And it really is all about creating those connections between who are the influential in each, uh, in each country. That is the core of the game. It is about the, the network view of society and of how um, all these people are connected to each other. Okay. And in terms of like, I guess like decision-making or progression, like how do you like actually like take over? Like what's like the general gameplay loop of the game? All right, yeah, sure. So when you enter a region, you start off with just your headquarters. Um, your headquarters has the ability to basically convert uh, units to your faction uh, by comparing different stats. So there are three stats in the game, uh, charm, bravery, and uh, resources. And that's how you're able to, say, bribe someone. The progression, though, is that you start at the bottom of the power pyramid, if you will. So you don't go and say, oh, I'm going to bribe this general. Now you actually have to start lower down the scale. So you know you start with uh, streamers, or with uh, journalists, or grunts, and they, as you recreate the network, they're able to support each other. So, for example, um, you converted a detective who's able to give privileged information to those that are connected to it, which makes their intimidation much more effective. And with that, you can start. Look, growing up the ladder of power until you reach the leader. The leader is the most powerful unit in a different region. And it can be a celebrity, it can be a general, politician. And you will be, you will have to coordinate all those units that are underneath in order to be able to convert that leader. All right. And how does the AI like play against you? Are they kind of following like the same rules as you or are they doing their own thing? They're following the same rules. They are also converting units. They're also creating and cutting connections. Um, and sometimes they can be uh, talking about future work. I have to polish that AI because sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes they will have like, they will start converting units and then basically have their own network in lockdown. And cracking that nut is really tough until you find an opening, a weak link in the chain, a, a unit that is susceptible to your influence. And then that the whole network can come down. Hmm. In terms of, I think, the, the complexity of the game, like what kind of audience are you aiming for in terms of like their own uh, strategy knowledge? I am aiming, uh, aiming for people that are aware of strategy, that mm -hmm. they like uh, tactical games, and that also are comfortable with uh, like puzzle games. I, I find that a lot at a higher level, tactics games and puzzle games are very similar. Uh, so someone that says, okay, you know, I have to be able to think multiple steps ahead of what I'm mm -hmm. trying to do. This is not an easy game. It is not meant to be an easy game. Uh, it is not meant to be a game of like very wide appeal. Uh, I do not recommend it as your first strategy title, that's for sure. But I feel that players that do like the genre will find an interesting twist to their expectations. Right. And I'm trying to think if there's any other questions with regards to the general gameplay. Um, oh, uh, I think another important point when we talk about strategy games is the length of it, like how long a typical playthrough is. We've seen some games where some developers aim for like 30 minutes to an hour for a single match. We can, of course, go the Civilization Solaris route that, you know, the game is over, you know, question mark in the foreseeable future. Right. Uh, right now, this um, each region, and so each geographical region that you try to conquer, is uh, is estimated to 20 to 30 minutes of gameplay. And the current campaign map has 24 regions. Uh, right. I am thinking maybe of splitting Russia in two because it is way too big. <laughs> it uh, <laughs> causes a whole bunch of problems with zooming. Uh, but th that is uh, more or less the length of uh, that we're looking at. 
So with uh, when the game is launched in early access in June, in terms of like what's in it versus what's coming, like what is kind of like your overall idea for that? So when I launch uh, in early access, there will be um, three factions, the Illuminati, the Templars, and the Freemasons. There will be a campaign mode and a single game mode, which is Conquest, where you just try and conquer the world. Uh, there will also be only one victory condition, capture the leader. But there will also be a system of subquests and rewards in which, depending on how you go about in a specific level, you're able to build up your faction with different powers to make it easier to go into the next level. Things that I want to include uh, later on, uh, one of the big ones is the idea of national abilities, where once you've conquered a region, that region can have an active effect on multiple regions. So they can establish an embargo, for example, that makes bribing easier in, in a future region. But it's more of an active as opposed to a passive bonus. Uh, I also uh, want to include more factions. But before that, I want to make sure that the three factions that I have play distinctly. On launch, on early access, they'll be very similar to each other. They'll have similar rules. But I do want to explore the idea, OK, what happens if the Freemasons have slightly different rules than the Illuminati, just to keep things fresh as the game goes on. All right. And how long are you going to be planning to be in early access for? That is still TBD, to be honest. Uh, I do want to see what the initial reception of the game is. And I do want to see what kind of uh, what kind of bugs and issues are are found. Uh, I am a lone developer, so it is it is true that it takes me time to resolve any issues. So I don't want to give any strict dates for when we would be leaving early access. Uh, I just want to be able to commit myself to making the best game possible and to like really fleshing it out for the players. Right. Anything else regarding the design that we haven't touched on that you'd like to bring up? Oh, man, there's just like so many different aspects of it. Uh, something that I found really interesting in the design of this type of game is how the power balance between units actually works. So units here are static, right? They don't move. They all have uh, abilities that are not necessarily, they're not the same abilities, but there's the same type of abilities. And what really matters, what really distinguishes, say, a grunt from a general is basically their power rating. So what is their average stats? Now, because it is all about the connections, it is all about how uh, it's not about a single unit buffing itself right, and becoming bigger. It's about who they know and how these other units are able to buff them. I found that they're... The way the most important lever I have to control difficulty is actually the proportion between small units to big units. So units are not created in this game. You don't just buy new uh, new journalists. Like the 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 network already exists, and it's up to you to kind of tap it. And how to generate this network to have an appropriate level of difficulty? as the game progresses has been a challenge because of that, because it is very much uh, dependent on the number of units and what the proportion of lower tier units is to higher tier units. And trying to get like that unit balance, I think is a very tough order for any game like this. Because again, like if you're dealing with like a turn-based game, it's not about, you know, APM and, just you know how fast you move these units about what can this unit provide on the board and what we see in a lot of the better strategy games that every unit should have utility somewhere like you don't want to introduce a unit that is just bad that you should never have this unit like it's just dead space in the game and it's very hard i think when it comes to these kinds of games to balance them around all these different aspects off 100%. And I think that that's one of the big advantages of this new type of, uh, of gameplay, where because the units are not created, they're not a sink for player resources, they're actually the board itself. That means that even if your level two, uh, 
journalist is out there that, you know, and you're right now at a higher level, you're still trying to capture tier five units, that journalist can still contribute. It can still help other units based on how the connection is made. Or it can even protect you just by blocking off other other avenues of attack, other potential connections that an enemy faction can done can do. Uh, right. If it were, if there was a cost to each unit, then there's always this natural progression in strategy games where you start with smaller units and you get bigger ones, and the smaller ones just cannot compete. There is just this power curve that just is completely out of whack when you get to later the later game. Uh, the way my game is structured, it doesn't have that problem. It has a whole bunch of other problems. Mm -hmm. But uh, that specific one of uh, unit obsolescence is not one. All right. And again, I'm sure we'll have a lot more we can talk about in terms of shell government in June. And even beyond that, to see like where it goes once it gets into people's hands. I'd be happy to. Uh, I think the more indie developers talk about their projects, not just during development, but what happens after, you know, like there's so little information on, okay, what is, what does this game look like a year after, you know, like two years after, or even six months after. So I, I'd be happy to come back and uh, talk at any time and <laughs> for any amount of length, because I know <laughs> it's been a long one. Yep. All right, it, it sounds good. So I think we'll wrap up our discussion here for tonight. For people listening to us right now, I'll include links to the game as well, so, as well as to Rafael's uh, social media, any links he sends over, they'll be in the show notes. And be sure to check out the game when it is released in early access in June. And yeah, like I said, um, let's uh, keep in touch and we'll plan for something closer to either before or after the launch. Sounds great. No, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. No problem. So I think my final question for you for tonight is, do you have anything you would like to say to fans, anything you want to say about game development? You know, the final word is yours. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, I, I think that the final word here is the thing that I, throughout the whole conversation that's really stuck with me is uh, going into game development with your expectations set straight, knowing what you're getting into, and being aware of other games and really looking at other game genres and really searching out games that are different from what you usually play to learn more. I, I think that's the most important thing for any, any game developer, being an aspiring or veteran. Um, it is important to always be looking on how other developers are doing things and really trying to analyze it. So I uh, just encourage everyone to go on, uh, find a game that they hate and uh, <laughs> play it and play see why, why did the developers do it this way? <laughs> All right. Yep. Definitely get out there, play those games and make sure you study them as well. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So with that, we're going to wrap up this week's episode of the Perceptive Podcast. So be sure to do all that, liking and subscribing, check out our Discord channel and all that. And be sure to look at my books on design with hopefully there should be five of them out and another one coming along the way by the time this recording goes up. Again, uh, Raphael, thank you so much for coming on. Best of luck with the game. And I'll be happy to check it out when it is released. Thank you. Uh, yeah, awesome being here. All right. So with all that said, everyone, again, if you are a developer working on a game and want to come on and talk about, I am always looking for guests and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, whereas in the art and science of games. Until next time, take care. <laughs>